Welcome to Conversation with Peter Bogosian. Today I'm here with Alexander Biner. Thanks for coming and joining us for some Spectrum Street Epistemology. Yeah, thanks, uh, we're going to do something a little different today. We are going to have some semi-rapid fire initial questions about anything you want. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to drill down on our reasoning for certain claims. How's that sound? Sounds good. Uh, and you know the rules. You have to commit to a mat. Yep. All good. Okay, cool. Um, all right. You want to go first or you want me to go first? I, I go on for you. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Oh, I love um, this. I like how it's starting already. Let's say um, <clears throat> postmodernism uh -huh. is a valuable development in Western thought. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you're just coming out swinging, aren't you? Uh, <clears throat> I'm on the disagree. Oh, yeah. Do I stand as well? In yeah, yeah, that, you, yeah. And then you go, and you're on the. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, Matt. Read these. Strongly disagree, disagree. So, wait a minute. These are. Oh, yeah, yeah. We got mixed oh, yeah, up. Yeah, on, these are mixed on, up. Hold these on, are mixed yeah, up. Yeah. Let's do that. That's cool. Like it's postmodern. It can be yeah, anything right. you want it to be, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, I, I disagree. Why do you slightly agree? I was not expecting that. Yeah, I slightly agree because I think there are aspects around the critiques of power structures which are valuable and important originally. Yeah. And then I also make a distinction between the original sort of post-structural theory and the way it then plays out now in society as two distinct but interrelated things. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I got it. I. One of the reasons that I stood on the disagree and not, not to strongly disagree is because I do think that it's a way for people to hone their thinking mm -hmm. when they hear these critiques. It's a way to move the whole discourse forward. It's a way to develop reason and rationality to come up with criticisms, critiques, to really substantively engage these issues, even if they're completely deranged. Mm -hmm. It's a good thing. Mm -hmm. it's, it only fuels... I don't want to say positive epistemology because people mistake that with positivist, but it only fuels um, thoughtful ways to engage claims. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. You have yeah. another one? We'll do the rapid fire we'll for about five or ten fire. Um, Let's say, yeah, I don't want to bring it. So um, let's say Western culture can't survive without religion. Strongly agree. I'm gonna say agree. Yeah. yeah. Why? Yeah. Why are you on agree? I'm not. On, yeah. Why am I not on strongly agree? Partly because you're there. No, I wouldn't have stood there anyway. Like I, I'd be here because I do think we need a religious and metaphysical substructure to 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 call any culture. Um, I would say I'm pretty. I'm skeptical of the um, do it yourself spiritual but not religious right. approach. However, I also see places in which it is effective and does work. So in that sense, it does make me wonder. Could we do without the formalized religions? Could it actually be something we couldn't imagine yet that is right. kind of formed? But I'm also pretty skeptical that those deep foundations can be re uh, rebuilt in, in society. I, I have a claim for you, but before I do, mm -hmm. uh, I want to piggyback off something. So I have a question. <clears throat> Why does Western civilization need a metaphysics? I would say that it's impossible not to have a metaphysics. So to, to, just to hone, hone that idea a little bit, like ev atheism has a metaphysics, scientific materialism has a metaphysics, the metaphysics being Natural. what's true is matter, right? What's real is matter. Consciousness is a, is a, is a, is a, a secondary feature of that. Whereas, so, so it's impossible not to have one. I would say maybe to hone that, I would say we need a metaphysics that brings us towards meaning and purpose. Rather than that. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that is, I have a very substantive disagreement with that, but let's, mm -hmm. we're going to mm -hmm. pause on that. We're going to yeah, pause yeah, yeah. on it. Okay. Um, if you knew for a fact that artificial general intelligence achieved some kind of consciousness beyond consciousness and mm -hmm. could do all this crazy stuff, predict, solve all these mathematical things that couldn't be solved. <clears throat> and one of the things that it, one of the conclusions that it came to was God exists. Mm. Would you believe it? Hmm. Mm. I, I would believe it. I would believe, I would believe it. it. Um, Sorry. No, here. Um, the reason I'm, I'm on slightly disagree, I think the reason I'm here is that this is more about this is mainly about my conception of AI rather than my own metaphysics and my own belief in, in mm. God. But I would say that as with any intelligent entity, you cannot necessarily trust the conclusions it comes to as 
as sort of objectively true. So there's just as much there's just as much chance that it's making that statement in order to gain a particular advantage or in order to. So it could be lying. It could be lying. It could be lying. Basically, um, you know, if if it was basing it on, it depends also what we mean by God, because yeah, if it was yeah. saying, look, if you're talking about God and say perhaps the divine and say maybe a, a Taoist or Hindu sense of this kind of interconnected, self-emerging whole, that's not right, that right, far right. off okay. from the kind of like quantum a physics. Yeah, yeah, <clears throat> it's, it's not that far off from where some branches of physics might be taking us anyway. So I'll be like, yeah, okay, I, I can buy that. If it was talking about the Christian version of a, um, or a then, God. Then I would definitely. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. so how about you? What, what, why are you on neutral and what, what would you? What would you um, I just, I don't know how it could possibly know that. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't know. But the other thing is, it, <clears throat> if it does scale, that is, the more intelligent and conscious it becomes, mm -hmm. The furthest is well. The, the 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 further it is from my conceptions, so I can't even conceive of its conceptions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So even if it made its reasoning pro, it would have to make its reasoning transparent. But maybe at some level, at that level, there is no more reasoning. There's just something else. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> There's yeah. like a combination of, I don't know, some kind of symbolism. I don't know what it would be. It'd be something post linguistic, a yeah. kind of new epistemology that enabled a, but if that was true i wouldn't have access to that. you know what yeah. it's kind of like the same reason that i don't think like if some if a being claimed to be all-knowing the only way i could know that is if i were all-knowing because i would have to match my knowledge set with it no, it's all yeah <clears throat> yeah and it would know and like you it sounds like you're saying it would know in a different way <clears throat> like, i think it was like schopenhauer maybe talked about like you, you we like something about like to know the consciousness of a lion like we, we can't from our stance know what it's like to be a lion right because it's it's this completely alien consciousness yeah. so i think i'm probably uh bastardizing it a bit but dan but, dennett talks about that uh, bats yeah. And stuff. yeah but but at the same time i've got a dog and yeah. i see my dog as a sentient being right she's not exactly the same as me her consciousness is different but i'm pretty convinced that she has you know, a form of consciousness and agency in the world. And so the question is, AI, it's like, yeah, I can never know what it's like to be my dog, but I can make reasonable assumptions based on her behavior and All right. other things. I got a question for you. Mm. If you could push a button and increase your dog's intelligence by 100, I, 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 if I, I, can, I, I, I will push a button and increase my dog's intelligence by 100. This is a good idea. <laughs> well, you're in strongly disagree. I'm on agree. Why? Um, I don't want to rise up against me. No, that's, that's not the reason. It's uh, the, the reason is because this is about dogs, right? Mm. Because I'm like, th there is a certain like, each species has evolved for its particular niche, right? And yeah. a particular body. It's also evolved. She, her intelligence has evolved to be in the body she's in. So if I were to radically increase that intelligence, I just don't know what would happen. I get the image of like, you know, the sorcerer's apprentice and all the brooms. Like yeah. you just can't create this chain reaction of unknowns. So I don't know. If it, I think it's this. I don't think it would be ethical. I don't think it would be ethical to do that. And also, I don't really see the utility in me doing that. I mean, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, if she was 100 times smarter than how smart she is now, I'm curious how smart she would be. But, but that's maybe a, another question. I, I'm wondering why you're on agree. Um, <clears throat> I think it's as a general rule better to be. Well, first of all, I'm a dog lover, mm -hmm. and I love my dogs deeply. And uh, I think it's better to be intelligent than non-intelligent. Mm -hmm. And I think that that would enable me. Maybe it's a selfish reason to have a a deeper relationship with my mm -hmm. dog, if you will. And I think it would give my dog more access to things in the world. Mm -hmm. And that's what I would want for my dog. All right, I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. I would rather be known as a good per. No, I would rather be known as a good person than a good lover. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm probably going to actually go on agree. Okay, I'm going to go with, you. Agree, go go with uh, you. So we're both right. on here. Right. Yeah, I mean, Look, the, the reason I was hesitating is because obviously nobody wants to be known as not a good lover, right? right? Um, but at the same time, if I think there's a few different levels of this, right? There's a level of my own sort of moral sense in the world and, and how I see myself. 
and there I would prefer to be um, seen as a good person. Although it does kind of pain me to be like, oh, if that was the trade-off, that would right, kind of, that right. would kind that of would suck. Be a of the <laughs> but I think in terms of like, even if I was just being really utilitarian about it, yeah, and just me and the world, my relationships with people, right. my reputation. You know, it's like if someone's going to go into business with you, they're probably more likely to go, yeah, you know, but they're they're a they're a pretty good person. Um, and if you're a good lover, it's um, unless you're going into particular businesses. It's not. All right, can I? I want to piggyback off uh, that one. People are talking about you in another room. I would rather they say, "I'm a really smart guy," than I'm a rel than I'm a really good guy. I'm gonna have to go here. So you, you, so I, I'm on strongly degree. I would much rather they say I'm a really good guy than I'm a really smart guy. You're in the neutral. Why? I'm on the neutral because people's conception of goodness in other people is extremely based on their own projection and their own moral, moral foundations, right? Yeah. I might not share to use Jonathan Haidt's work, right? I might not share those foundations. So i would take with a pinch of salt this is also a personal thing i think if they said i'm not smart that would hit a particular trigger in me because yeah. there's also a way in which like yeah, yeah there's a way in which it becomes um detrimental for people to think you're stupid but anyone can kind of be thought of as a good person right there's you yeah. know when people pass away it's always like yeah, you're yeah. a good person there's yeah. not the nuance there so i think it's kind of a cultural it, it almost kind of doesn't mean that much, but I think it means something if, if someone's like, yeah, they're not that clever. Okay, let me, so do you think that that, don't tell me your age, but do you think that that has to do with your age? Do you think if you advanced 20 years or so to be my age that you would, I, I'm just, I don't know. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's hard to say. Um, would, it, would it change? Probably not. I don't. I don't think I would necessarily have changed my view on um, what people conceive of as good or bad in another mm -hmm. person. Right. That's why I'm on neutral because it's like obviously I would like them to think I'm a good person and I would like to be seen as a good person. Like of course, um, but there is a sense in which um, that can almost be a trap. It can be a trap to kind of be. You know, it's like where pleasing comes from. It's like I really want everyone to like me. That that can be a trap to fall into. So I'm, I'm not sure. It oh, yeah, be, yeah, because if they're bad people and you please them and they say you're a good person, then it's actually a net negative. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Exactly. I'd rather have integrity. I'd rather be seen as someone who stands by their word and is, is solid oh, and let's is fair. Do, let's do that claim. Yeah. I'd rather, if people were talking about me in, the, in, a, in a room, I would rather them see me as a person of integrity than they would see me as a really smart guy. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. I'd definitely be over here with that. That, that feels, there's a, there's a difference between those two things for me. Pretty significant difference, right? Um, yeah, integrity feels more solid than goodness to me, you know? Good, yeah, goodness solid is, is a good word yeah. because that's what integrity is. Yeah. I'm, go I'm going back to your point that you said before. It does depend on the system in which one lives. If yeah. the system in which one lives, everybody's a fucking lunatic or yeah. a crazy person or something, then then for them to perceive you as having integrity would be a bad thing. Yes, yeah. we've killed so many people yeah, today. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. Um, yeah. Well. All right, we're going to drill down some claims, but um, before... Oh, I have one, I have mm -hmm. one. Mm -hmm. um, it is likely that we are living in a simulation. Really, we're both strongly disagree on that. Why? Why do you strongly disagree? Um, because I think because having looked at simul, having spoken to physicists and philosophers about this right. a, a decent amount, um, including Bernardo Castro, who who is both. Um, I think the the overall claim is is somewhat meaningless, right? This this because I'm going to go over here just to listen to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So in a way, it's like the. The idea of living in a simulation implies some other higher order, which is intentionally created a simulation, often in the way I hear it. Right. Right. I, you know, if we're talking about, and then if we're talking about, okay, the universe itself is in some way sort of simulating its own existence, that for me feels like a new point, right? Because mm. it's like, okay, maybe that is the case, but that doesn't really 
No, I'm with you. I'm with yeah. you. Yeah, and it's it's basically basically it makes it sound like it's the Matrix, and there's some kind of other agent controlling the simulation. And I think there's just no philosophical foundation or physical foundation. Okay, for that. so something you said was confusing to me. Why would you consult a philosopher for that? Uh, well, Bernardo Castrop specifically is a physicist and a philosopher, okay. which is why he's an idealist um, <clears throat> philosophically. So he has a consciousness first perspective on it. So that that's where I would probably, that's why I would see he's both, right? But if I was going to consult someone, I think I would consult both. I think I would want to consult a physicist and a philosopher because it's at the limits of physics. And when science gets to the limits of its paradigm, philosophy can play an important role in trying to, to ensure truth claims stay fairly solid. Only if the philosophers understand the physics. Yes. That's true. That's true. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Most philosophers don't. I think, yeah. I think, yeah. Uh, I'll give you last question and yeah. we'll drill down on some questions. Mm -hmm. oh, you, you want to ask me? You don't have to. Anything is... Mm. A claim. claim. Sorry. Claims. Shit. No, no, sorry, no. That's sorry, cool. Sorry, that's cool. Sorry. Let me, let me have a think. Um... Yeah, um, so we are currently living in the safest, most sustainable uh, kind of world that there's ever been, and Correct. it's likely to continue like that. Is it likely to it's continue? likely to continue. Oh, boy. Um, wow, what a question that is. Um, um, boy, I just have kind of inside information on that question. So um, let me see. Um, boy, that is a tough one. Okay. I'm going to go to slightly disagree. Where are you? I'm I'm actually probably the same place. Really? Uh, yeah. yeah uh, I was so gonna I'm going to go over here to not, yeah. cre not creep you out a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Why do you slightly agree? Um, I'm slightly agree because I think there is, I think there are basically, we are moving towards some kind of upheaval, collapse situation right. overall. Um, and there's a lot of different lenses we can look at that through. However, we're also part of an incredibly complex system. So there's always emergence and unpredictability in that. Mm. So in that sense, I don't think you can say necessarily either way, but I do think the trend right now is towards some kind of inflection point or multiple yeah, inflection yeah, yeah. points. Yeah. Nick Bostrom has some good stuff about X risks, yeah, which yeah. terrify me. Uh, just as a, a few points of contact, not necessarily to linger on this too long, but the, I'm trying to say this without dis overly disclosing anything. Many uh, uh, very high-tech computer companies have mm -hmm. placed money into two things. You can guess one of them, which is AGI or mm -hmm. artificial intelligence, yeah. artificial general intelligence. But the other one is probably unlikely you'll guess. You want to take a guess at from what my sources, so my very ultra-reliable sources. Is it underground me. bunkers? No, <laughs> no, no. It's a quantum computing. Uh huh. Okay. And when you start to really think about that, yeah. it is so mind blowing. Yeah. It's like, I mean, anything with the word quantum when it's legitimately used in terms of the realm of the very small is mind blowing. Mm. But when you think about the possibilities of like tapping into just, I mean, it's just, it's so, I can't even. Yeah. So, anyway, that's one of the reasons that I stood on slightly. slightly if I may, have you ever seen Man in the High Castle? Uh, I've read the book, and oh, I've yeah, seen yeah. maybe, I think I saw the first season of it. Yeah. The, the third season was good, uh, but there's this, I, I'm hesitant to say, can I tell you what happened in the third season? Yeah, I, I imagine it's similar to the book, so I'm cool with that. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so one of the things they do in the third season is they they develop this thing that enables them to plumb other worlds. And I, I've had this idea for a long time to write a science fiction script of <clears throat> the, these individuals who are trying to figure out if they're in a simulation. Mm. So they create in tandem billions of simula simulations and they run them fast forward to see if how the, those people figure it out. Yeah. And what they do is they, they then plumb individual worlds for technology, different technologies that they don't have, bring them from those worlds to their worlds. <clears throat> That's and very interesting. That The man in the high castle hit them like, oh shit, it took my idea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah. Back at the store, we'll maybe talk about later DMT extended state and DMT <clears throat> yeah, experience. Okay. That's quite similar. Let's go yeah. to, let's, let's do that. Let's go mm -hmm. to, to, to DMT. Um, I don't know. Are you comfortable revealing your personal experiences? Oh, yeah. It's all, it's all in my book. So I'm, I'm good with that. Okay. So yeah, you're yeah. comfortable with yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. So you've done it. Uh, I've done, oh, yeah. I mean, I've done 
regular DMT. So DMT is, uh, as if people don't know, you know, it's a very powerful psychedelic molecule, which is actually in the mammalian brain and in probably in most plants, really. It's, it's a tryptamine, which is very common in nature. So we have all got DMT in us all yeah. the time. Not, no one's quite sure exactly why. It might be related to dreaming. It might be related to near-death experiences. We don't know. So normally people vaporize DMT. The experience is about 10 minutes long. It's yeah. very intense. Your body metabolizes it very, very quickly because it's endogenous. So it's a very intense experience of encountering, going to different dimensions, people experience, encountering entity, powerful insights. And then, so at Imperial College London, just down the road from here, they did a study on extended state DMT. Yeah. So pumping <clears throat> DMT into us for... I was, for, was going to ask you about yeah, that. Yeah. Do, do, you, do you believe that it... So two things. I have a friend who, who d does it regularly, and he's told me about the purple people he sees, and mm. he swears up and down that he's had sex with them. Like, I, I'm, <laughs> so my, my, here's my question. And this is my... I could be, t t I'm mm. just a spitballing here. Yeah, yeah. Do you think that those experiences map a, a place, a physical place? So like you could send people in to just map out literally the terrain of mm. the space. Yeah, it's, it's a key question in this area of study, right? Mm. And, and the answer isn't <laughs> as simple as that there's a, I think there's a there there. Let me mm. say that, right? I think there is a distinct reality that is independent of our perception of it, but deeply intertwined with our perception of it, right? right? So I know that sounds a little bit esoteric, but there, there is, I think, an argument to be made for, it depends if you're a materialist or an idealist or a panpsychist, yeah. you know, I don't necessarily see the brain as the generator of consciousness, but the receiver of consciousness, so that any sufficiently complex system is able to then tap into consciousness, right? And so there are some who really see DMT as almost a technology for accessing different, different worlds, effectively. Now, I don't know, right? Having had, you know, I've had these DMT extended state experiences, which only, probably only nine of us on that study, there's a few people doing it around the world. It's probably less than 100 people in the world who've done it, right? So we talk to each other to try to like figure that out. And you have to have a really clean um, sort of philosophical approach because ultimately we don't know. It could absolutely all be generated in the brain. And we're all just, uh, you know, extrapolating. Uh, it could also be independently arising. It could be Even both. if it's generated in the brain, though, yeah. if there are commonalities, you could still map the space. Yes, absolutely, you could. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, um, yeah, and people do uh, sometimes have shared experiences. People have telepathic phenomena. My friend uh, David Luke is a professor at Greenwich University. He's a parapsychologist. He's done a lot of research around this. And, you know, what he points out is, like, it's incredibly difficult to research. Because let's say we, we both do DMT. And they've done, people have done this, gone in with a math problem that neither of us could possibly solve. There's only like three guys at MIT who can solve it. We go in with a math problem. We ask the entities, help me solve this problem. They give you a solution. Let's say they but even you can't take it you out. You can't take it out. That happens. No. Or let's, let's even imagine you could take it out. And you come back and one of us is like, bam, I got the solution. Um, technically, there's no proof that that was from a DMT entity. Okay, you it's proof say, enough for me. If I did that, <laughs> I can barely add. That's proof, be proof enough yeah, for, for me. me. Be, I mean, it would personally be proof. But from his perspective, he's like, you know, it could have been that telepathically one of those MIT scientists sent it to you. We don't know how these things work. So it's okay, really... So if, if yeah. that... I'm not buying any of that. If that happened, yeah. someone went like me yeah. with zero math experience yeah. Yeah. and came out uh, of the experience and they sold saw gold box trajectory, I'd be like, <clears throat> that's evidence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, overwhelming evidence, actually. That that's put put me on the strongly agree. Yeah. Um, but I wanna I wanna drill down on on some things here. Um, something you said. There is something beyond the material. Mm -hmm. I'm almost hesitant to go to the strongly agree. <laughs> um strongly disagree you mean yeah yeah strongly yeah, yeah. disagree um i'm almost hesitant why why do you strongly agree that there's something beyond the material because i don't think physicalism or materialism as it's known as a, as a philosophical stance i don't think it's consistent with what we're finding out um about uh, the sub subatomic world and i don't think it is philosophically sound because you can, the only thing that you can say for certain 
is that you are having an experience, right? You're having a qualitative experience right now. We okay. are both, right? Right. I don't even know for certain that you are. I could just be, you know, Correct. that solipsism, right? Correct. I'm not a solipsist, but just, just to make a point. Correct. So, and there's even, there's even like, even Andre Lind is a, you know, very accomplished physicist. Even he's made this point. He's like, we extrapolate based on shared phenomena that we can measure. And it's not that we shouldn't do that for sure, right? right. But at the core of it, I think the only, the, the most philosophically sound position to hold is that there is quality. There's, there's a qualitative experience of the world, okay. right? And that means um, consciousness and the non-physical is primary and the physical is then secondary okay. from that perspective, right? So... That, that's where that's why I said okay yeah. <clears throat> correct me if I'm wrong but you would have to rule out alternative explanations for you to be on the strongly agree like you would have to <clears throat> if if it's of a high likelihood that you're correct and I would argue we don't even know that that would be the case we don't know yeah. right yeah that <clears throat> sorry I'm getting over nasty cold um, so you wouldn't you have to stand on the agree then? Because yeah, I, actually, actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that because, because basically, yeah, it, it does have to be here because what happened there is that there's also direct experiences I've had which confirm that, that, that belief. Yeah, that doesn't mean the belief is on stronger philosophical correct, ground. Correct. So I would say, based on what I just said, yeah. it's, it's more somewhere here that, that I, that I agree there is something beyond the physical. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. Do you think that your desire for do you have a desire for something to be on the beyond the physical? Yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. I think I, I, think I do too. Yeah, yeah, I yeah. Think, I think it'd be. Yeah, I, I yeah. do. Um. So. I'm so I'm on the disagree. The reason I'm not on the strongly disagree is I think that I have to. I would have to be. Um, it's interesting. I, I just can't rule out that explanation. Mm. I think a lot of the problems with, just as an example, supernatural claims of supernatural realm is the only way you would know that is the imprint in the physical realm. Mm -hmm. So you'd see the imprint, even if it were, you didn't have an explanation, there'd be no, you, you just didn't know it was, what was mm -hmm. going on. It's like a, um, maybe there was a, a fourth dimensional object that had a manifestation in three dimensional space and you just like a, three-dimensional object manifesting in two-dimensional space and that like it like the from flatland you know mm -hmm. yeah, yeah yeah so that you'd only see layers in the third dimension like maybe yeah. there's something that manifests in the fourth but that wouldn't be supernatural that would be you have a naturalistic explanation for that but maybe you yeah. wouldn't have the tools technologically to know but it would appear to you as if it were supernatural so yes i have to be open to the possibility mm. my problem is i don't know what evidence would be sufficient to point me there mm -hmm. because it would all be natural. It would, yeah. It yeah, yeah. Would be, but the, I think part of the, the tangle comes if we have these binary positions around matter and, and what's beyond matter, yeah. matter and consciousness, because, you know, for example, Ian McGilchrist describes right. it nicely where he talks about, right. he sees matter as a phase of consciousness. And right. I'm actually a panpsychist rather than an idealist. So I think matter and consciousness are like Spinoza said, are of one substance, right? So in that sense, there's not really a contradiction. To, I think I agree with what you're saying. Actually, it you know how would we figure out that that we're accessing non-physical information? Right. Well, we'd have to confirm it with each other right. in, the, in the physical world and ideally sort of in the world. Um, so if those two things are intricately linked, then then this gets really esoteric in a way because the physical is itself something that points beyond itself, right? So it's yeah. Um, we're going to do a, a, a super chat here from, uh, I can't even begin to pronounce that. Math is supernatural. That's a question. I love that. <laughs> Math, we got a great So audience. we got a claim. Yeah. Math okay. is supernatural. I'm going to go strongly disagree. I'm going to go disagree, I think. Okay. Um, and I'm going to go over here, even though I'm not strongly disagree. Yeah, Tell yeah. me why. Well, I, I'm watching Foundation on Apple TV at the oh, moment, which is, I'm sorry. Yeah, 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 which is great. So I've, I've got that kind of, uh, yeah, I think yeah. it's a, like very much in my mind. I would strongly disagree because I don't, like, I think, okay, the term supernatural, that is sort of goes beyond the natural world and is sort of yeah. unknowable in some way. 
I don't in in on some level I don't think anything is supernatural. I think everything is sort of contained within one one kind of wholeness. Right. So in that sense, I think huh. I think math can point towards things that are outside of our existing perceptual frame, and that it has a kind of quality where it is, of course, like the unity, whatever unity there is in the universe, math is pointing toward it, right? right? To some some way. So I think it can appear supernatural at times. Like, oh my God, like the, you know, like, okay, like in foundation, like, my God, right. you can predict the future. It looks right, like magic, right, but right, actually right, it's right. just really good maths. So I think that's kind of where I stand on it. Yeah. Uh, and you, what's your... Oh, uh, I, I, uh, I disagree with Max Tegmark. I disagree with, I, I think it's so simple... As, as to be almost ludicrous. It's just, it, it's an empirical experiment we've run over and over again. I don't believe you need any Platonism for it. I don't mm -hmm. believe you need to pause in any exterior or external realm. It's literally counting. It's Again, it's an experiment we've performed over and over. When you take one object and you add another object, you get two objects and you can do that into infinity. My writing partner has a really interesting uh, earlier book about in, infinity where he he writes about that. In fact, his PhD was in that, and he's helped mm -hmm. uh, James Lindsay help sharpen my my thoughts about that. But I think that um, I, so I'll just uh, I'll, maybe mm -hmm. I'll overshare. Mm -hmm. But I found that once you really start eliminating Platonism from your thought, mm -hmm. like this kind of dualism, other realms and stuff, it just sharpens your thinking for naturalistic explanation of phenomena. Mm -hmm. And not only does it sharpen your thinking, but you're able to bring to bear relevant tools as an explanatory method for those. So you don't have to basically make shit up, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> you yeah, can yeah, just yeah, kind yeah. of, and then you can have a belief system that both tethers and coheres. Yeah, that's that, that's a pretty fundamental. I'm actually curious about your thoughts on infinity just briefly, because that's it's quite yeah. fundamental to this bigger question. Like right. my understanding from like, Carlo Rovelli, um, one of his books, he talked about, this process that happened in physics where the question was, is the universe infinite or yeah. is it finite? Yeah. And at least in his camp, they came onto the, the, the conclusion that it must be finite. It can't be infinite uh, for it to work. So I don't know whether that's well, something let's, that, yeah. let's, let's, let, let's talk about that. I don't want to talk about this because it, it could be a total sinkhole for the conversation, mm -hmm. but there could be an infinite regress. Mm -hmm. There could be turtles all the way down. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think I'm gonna go. I'm on. I'm gonna go to strongly agree. I'm gonna go slightly, slightly disagree. Just and this is based on me not being a physicist yeah. and me dabbling and trying to understand quantum physics yeah, over, yeah. over the years. Right. Yeah. I was fairly, or I am right now, fairly convinced uh, uh, around the the reasoning as to why there is. Like why why there isn't an infinite regress, right? Because they because it, it it seems that other things don't work if that's the case, but it's just unfathomably large and perhaps even expanding. But there is limitation, like limitation exists, f finiteness exists. Because if you say infinite, that that oh, okay. So yeah. let's let's drill down that because I think it's important. So your idea that finiteness exists, yes, is a consequence of an evolutionary process of our ancestors hunting gazelles on the savannah 10,000 years ago. It wasn't mm. meant to be applied to the realm of the very, very small, or the realm of the very, very large. E no, I, that's not, well, yes, sure, the way I think, and, okay. and me right now processing information about those two realms, yeah. sure, there's, there's, you know, I'm trying to process that, but, and, and we don't have an experience of the infinite in day-to-day -day life right uh, right but my understanding is more that what we're observing doesn't necessarily make sense with the idea of infinite of the universe being infinitely large or kind of infinitely expanding so okay so i think what's happening in the conversation i yeah. think i'm having a conception of it one way uh -huh. so let me tell you my conception yeah of yeah, it. yeah my conception of it is that the big bang if we accept that as a as mm. a causal so let's just accept by fiat that we can. Sure. Is that that's just one instantiation in an infinite number of instantiations that are currently occurring and have occurred infinitely in the past. Mm -hmm. I think there. I think there's no reason not to think. And Victor Stringer argues this in the God and the Multiverse. There's no reason to think that this instantiation, this kind of one thing that you and I, mm. are in, that it 
well, okay, well, the next step is, well, one, there's no reason to think that there it couldn't go all the way back and all the way yeah. forward. I think this whole idea that things have to have a beginning is a consequence of an evolutionary product, process that brought you and me here now to enable us to survive. Mm. But so that's one thing. That's one way of thinking about yep. it. Yeah. And, you know, Dawkins has, has speculated, you know, what if you, the only reason it could be mm. that quantum physics is weird to you and weird to me is that we didn't kind of grow up on it. And he's posited what would happen if you just kind of immersed a kid in it through digital technologies, if it just became cognitively normative for them. Mm. I, I don't know, obviously, it'd probably be a cruel experiment to run on somebody. <laughs> But it would but be kind of interesting, yeah. though. Yeah, yeah, it is interesting. Yeah, I feel. Yeah, let, let's move on because I feel like the ed. The, I'm going to get into speculation. Yeah, stuff yeah, I don't about, know, that's yeah, where yeah, I am yeah. too. So, do yeah. you have a question for me, or we we read us some questions on there? Yeah, let, let's um, go for what are these? Um, yeah. Oh yeah, that's an interesting one. Prayer works. Prayer works. Uh, we need to disambiguate works. Yeah. Um, yeah, that definitely because I've just written a, a piece on this. Um, and I think we need to, so what's the better way to say that? So let's say, um, let's say prayer, and this is more maybe more interesting, prayer yeah. is a rational activity to engage in. To what end? To make you feel better? Um, yeah. Pr pr prayer is a rational prayer, activity yeah. to engage in to yeah. make you feel better. Yeah. Um, no, 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 wait, oh, I want to just hone oh, that. Okay. Not necessarily to make you feel better. It's a rational activity to engage in in response to the unknown. Okay, I'm on strongly disagree, you're on agree. Yeah. Why? So because I think prayer, well, I have some spiritual ideas around that, which which are, I won't go into, right? Because so I think more interesting is just the nuts and bolts of it. So I think what prayer does for humans is that it basically takes us to the limits of our agency, right? right? When our agency no longer cuts the mustard, right? We turn to prayer, right, and correct. what that I, I, this is a theory that I'm developing. I think what that process does is it it tells you something that is actually true, which is you don't have control, right? When something oh, okay. major is happening, or there's a level of complexity that there's just absolutely no way I as an individual can process. What prayer does is create a psychological, or you could say, psycho spiritual stance that is actually objectively true, like. Because the other response is, I'm going to go into anxiety it, and try and control it. Okay, does it create it or is it a response to it? I would say it creates it because it's both. It's both. Because let, let's say I'm confronted with something that's totally beyond me and it's just crushing me. It's just too much, right? Death of a loved one. Death with a loved one, exactly, right? So um, turning to prayer, I don't have control in that situation. That's already true, right? right? It's, it's happened. I'm in pain. I can't control that. I'm in pain. Turning to prayer is something that will help me to reframe and contextualize that experience. What I could also do is just get blind drunk and run into the streets and start screaming. Right. That's also a response I could have. So in that sense, what prayer oh, will see, do is, is move me towards some kind of reconciliation, whereas getting blind drunk um, won't or it might, but it probably won't. And maybe it's an odd question, but wouldn't it depend on what you what tools emotional and psychological tools you had available to you yeah so if you had a wide range of, of uh coping mechanisms available to you do you think ah if you had a wide range of of quote-unquote best practices yeah. psychological tools available to you prayer would be just as good as those you are here. Yeah, I strongly agree with that. Oh, wow. I strongly disagree yeah. with that. All right. So here's what we're going to do. Yep. <clears throat> so when someone stands in the strongly agree, shit, sorry. Thanks, man. Cool. When someone stands in the strongly disagree and somebody else stands in the strongly agree, I'm going to guess your best reason for why you believe that. Don't mm -hmm. show me. Mm -hmm. And you're going to guess my best reason for that. So, uh, Reed, we need to write down the claim again. It was uh, if you have a wide variety yeah. of tools available to you um prayer is how did i phrase it equally good coping tools uh of best practices coping tools available to you 
prayer is uh, what did we say? I can't. Still, still a good one. Still a right. Still the right. best one. Yeah, yeah. All right. So I'm going to um, respond to that. All right. Okay. All right, I'm finished. Okay, yeah, so me too, one second. Yeah. <clears throat> and contained within my answer is what it would take me to move. All right, so I'm gonna guess why you're there. Um, I I think that you're on the strongly agree to that claim um, because unlike psychological tools that enable one to cope, prayer enables one to see beyond oneself. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. That's that's pretty much it. Yeah. So no other practices do. Yeah. No other practices solve that. I don't have agency problem. Right. As well, because of that, because okay. they don't help us see beyond ourselves. Yeah. Okay. Necessary. Cool. Yeah. All right. You, you want to guess mine? I'm going to guess that you strongly disagree because prayer, prayer doesn't change anything in the world in the way that those psychological coping mechanisms have, have the chance to that they could change your behavior in a, in a different way. Um, no, but that may be a corollary adjunct answer. The, your answer, that may actually be a better answer. Yeah, so, so this is the other thing we're incorporating this. Mm. The the response that you gave me for what you thought yeah. I was gonna say, it's actually better than what I have here. Okay. Interesting. But it's yeah. it's an adjunct, it's related. Okay. So what did you have there? Um, I'm just gonna tell you prayer would have to be evidence based. It is not. Sure. Like, I need to yeah. see a large now. There are studies on this, <laughs> but those studies are largely uh, religious communities, et cetera. Those the studies correlate to communities. Yeah. But if I had the evidence, I would definitely, I would, if I saw that evidence large scale and it dealt with individuals who were solitary praying and sure. have some kind, as opposed to praying in a community, um, then, then I'd be willing to move. Um, now, is this, this is important. Is this evidence for the role that prayer would play in their psychological coping? Or is it for the evidence that prayer would play in changing the situation? No, the, situation? Form, the, the, the former. In yeah, the way right, that right. They, they dealt with situations. I yeah. tell my, uh, yeah. my uh, uh, grandmother, who's extremely sick. I saw. Sorry. Yeah, yeah, I heard really, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I saw my grandmother, who's extremely sick, and prayer helped her deal with mm. uh, things. And I used to um, go over there and take mm. care of her. Um, but but it was insane and, and uh so i definitely think it and it has the potential to be transformative to an individual but i'm not <clears throat> sure that that's more or less transformative mm -hmm. than other best practices that have been yeah uh, tested by evidence but now i've become increasingly suspicious okay mm -hmm. um all of the causes that make prayer work are naturalistic causes uh just say well, you're, this you're, is tricky because because of the word naturalistic and, okay. and my philosophical stance. But I'm still going to still go and slightly disagree. You're going to slightly disagree. I'm yeah. going to strongly agree. So, yeah. so, in in the if I may guess, in you you're staying a slightly slightly uh, disagree because you think that you weigh the possibility of there being non naturalistic explanation for phenomena. Yes, and yeah, greater than I weigh that, and causally, then that's that's why you're on that line. Yeah. That also means you're consistent in your belief set. Yes. Yeah, I would say so. Uh, yeah, that's that's fairly accurate. Like I would say, um, so okay, what makes prayer work? There's gestures. There's some kind of belief system, or there's yeah. some kind of experiential connection to something beyond oneself. All of those things are naturalistic phenomena, right? right. They're all me. You know, I say bowing or or yeah, being yeah. in stillness. Some kind of gesticulation to the higher power, maybe. Yeah, yeah but yeah. at the same time, we do not know whether the universe itself is alive and conscious and if there's a way to access and communicate with it through different practices like prayer. 
right? So in that sense, a naturalistic practice, like even like dancing into a trance, can then potentially connect me to something beyond myself that is beyond uh -huh. my naturalistic consciousness. Um, it sometimes makes sense to pray in response to geopolitical events. Yeah. This is literally what I wrote about <laughs> recently. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so anyone who's read that piece would be surprised if I went anywhere else because... Uh, All right. Yeah, yeah. So we, I'm on strongly disagree. You're on strongly agree. Yeah. The claim is uh, it sometimes makes sense to pray in response to geopolitical events. Um, I'm writing my answer now. Um, all right. Okay. Yeah. All right, you finished? I'm going to try mm -hmm. to guess yours. Yeah. You are on strongly agree because you think that if en enough people pray, that will give them a feeling of ameliorating their suffering, which will have a direct consequence to the real world of helping the problem. No, actually, quite different. Quite okay, different. don't tell me what it okay. is yet. Yeah. Is the, what I said better or worse than what you have written down there? I would say worse. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Um, you want to guess mine? I'm going to guess that you you think it distracts from people taking real practical real world action. That's exactly what it is. Uh -huh. People yeah, stop yeah. looking and working for solutions. Yeah. All right. But I'm going to try to try to guess yours again. Yeah. Um, it sometimes makes sense to pray in response to geopolitical events. Um, you. I, I would be amazed if you believe, if the best reason you have for believing that is that it's going to causally change those events. Yeah, no, that's not it. Yeah, that couldn't yeah. be because then we, we, we wouldn't be in the catastrophe. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. exactly. <laughs> um, yeah. Yeah. So you, you believe that because um, you think that prayer eliminates much of the detrimental psychological effects to individuals who are suffering from uh, hardships due to war, for example. Uh, it, it's closer, right? I think what's important here is who's the subject praying, right? Uh -huh. Because if you are in and being affected directly by the event, um, well, the first, okay, there's a couple levels to this. Firstly, I don't think prayer stands in place of action. Okay. Right? I think these are mutually arising things. I'm, I'm talking about it from, let's say, geo. From the framing of the question, a geopolitical event, let's say it's not happening to us, right? right We're right. witnessing it, or let's say we are affected by it in some way. Most of the time, we don't have agency over it, right? Right, right. right. In fact, we have, we might have some agency, but what, like I was arguing before, I think what prayer does is helps us to process the limits of our agency so that we can actually do better sense making. We can actually look at the situation and go, I'm powerless here. Okay, but what is my power? Right. Okay, I've got a sphere of agency. Maybe, let's say, at the beginning of the Ukraine war, it's like maybe I can donate some sleeping bags. Maybe that's something I can do. But I can't stop war, right? So, so I think it, it basically improves our cognition to the degree where actually we could then okay. take small, probably realistically small practical actions. I don't think any amount of prayer is going to change the outcome of event. But I think, like you said, I've seen the, you know, like new age or Buddhist groups that get 500 people together. We're going to pray for peace in this place. And <laughs> right, it's, a, right. it's a misunderstanding. Yeah, it's an empirical yeah. testable phenomenon. So yeah. um, prayer is a form of dishonesty toward oneself. Prayer is a form of dishonesty toward oneself. I'm on the neutral. You're on the strongly disagree. Uh, Why? Um, Mark Twain said, you can't pray a lie, right? So I'm going to, I'm on here because of the phenomenology of the experience itself is one that is based on coming in front of a higher power or process as you are. That's what makes prayer, that's what I would say makes prayer work well. Now, I think it could, it depends how we define prayer, because if it's just, hey, I want a Tesla, 
come on, God, give me a Tesla. Right. Yeah, yeah, that is lying to yourself. You're just in wish fulfillment. That's not really prayer, though, I think, in, in a way, a lot of yeah, religious traditions. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. I, 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 I would agree to that. Let's, let's move on from uh, prayer. Mm -hmm. You want to do, uh, we can do culture, we can do big questions, we can do technology, we can do ethics. Why don't we do technology, just to mix it up a little bit? All right. AGI, um, and, AGI yeah. should have rights. AGI should have rights. Oh, wait a minute. Sorry. Yeah, 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 yeah. AGI should have rights. I'm on the strong agree. You're on the slightly agree. I'm very surprised to see you there. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think it's it's a question of us not really knowing what the AGI's algorithms are based on, right? So we don't know whether we're talking about AGI in a sense of um, okay, let's, I mean, this goes back to the philosophy of it. Is it, does it have personhood? If it has pro proper AGI, does proper AGI have personhood, right? That's the key question. Does it have a body? Because also, as far as we know about everything we know about that is conscious, has some kind of physical manifestation that is in, embedded in the world. That would change, that would change it for me, right? Really? If yeah. it had a body. Yeah. And so if it were just disembodied in a in, in in a box that could be transferred around that would be different for you weirdly i think it would at, at this time because i don't know like look like blake lemoyne right mm. the google technologist who got fired um before all this kicked off <laughs> yeah, yeah. claiming his capital attention like there is we are incredibly bad at ascribing the correct amount of agency or personhood to things that look like they mm -hmm. have them. Like there's a, a MIT researcher, Sherry Turkle, did this with kids with Furbies. Remember the Furby? Yeah. You know, kids with Furbies would like bury their Furby, give a funeral for it, right. you know, wouldn't want to buy another one. And it's like, that's like a little, you know, thing that talks, right? Mm. We are, as they're kids, but adults do it too. You know, we pat a car. We're like, good, you know, what a reliable girl <laughs> for a boat, like whatever it is. So I think we are so bad at figuring out whether it actually has agency right. that we, we we would need to figure that out before we get it right. So that's why I'm kind of on slightly agree rather than a stronger agreement. <clears throat> so I'm curious, so a couple of things, the <clears throat> agency came up, which is interesting, uh, and the bodies thing came up, which yeah. is interesting. So let's, I want to drill down on the body thing. So um, if a person, let's see, a person whose brain has been perfectly copied, whose mind has been perfectly copied and stored digitally should have rights. Five, four, three, two, one, move. Oh. Yeah. So you still don't agree, I still don't strongly agree. So that must mean you think that bodies play a smaller role or else you would have moved to the other side. Yeah, it's something about sentience. It's about the nature of the sentience. Oh. Because a human being has been in the world and is like deeply a part of the world. They've now died. They're still them and they're somewhere else, right? The AI, like it's something like this. It's like, it's like the, is the AI in this kind of disembodied form in a server somewhere? Is it, can you be really truly conscious and sentient without a direct feedback to the world? Because all of our cognition is based on that, right? So, or does it just appear to be that? Right? That's why I'm kind of interested in, in this question of does it have a body? Because it has to have skin in the game. Right? It also, I think, has to be mortal. It has to, it has to have the chance that its consciousness will end. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, it's fascinating. Why does it have to be mortal? Because if you can't die, you can't really be alive. You're really more just a... Um, the, the, being alive implies the fact that you can no longer be alive. So in, in some sense, I guess it would be always true because eventually the earth is going to be destroyed by, you know, by our sun. So, but, but, but I think for just, just practically the qualitative experience of being alive, how can I, like, our whole conception of what it is to be conscious is based on our mortality, I would argue. So if it doesn't have that experience, I don't know whether I would see it with sentient or conscious in the same way. It's true of every single thing in, that we know of in, in the universe. That's what we call alive, basically. Yeah, so I'm trying to think. So do you ever see the show The Highlander? Yeah. Yeah, you know, they like walk around and they live yeah. immortal until they cut their, cut heads. their heads off. Yeah, yeah. 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 So uh, the, and then the final Highlander was given the gift of, of mortality. Ah, and yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
Okay, so I guess that doesn't work. But <clears throat> excuse me, I was trying to think of something in which you know, like I I get the skin in the game thing, mm. but it it would seem to me that if you couldn't die, you would still be alive. Well, I guess you'd have to define alive. Yeah, and also we have no basis of what that would actually look like. Right? Right. And I guess maybe it's not even possible. I don't know. This is an interesting question. Is that even possible? Because possibly this whole universe is going to implode <clears throat> at some point right. or burn out or, or something. So in some sense, it's just about the time scales, right? Yeah. But I'm curious, what, why are you so strongly in agreement for, for AGI having... Um, I'm a big fan of rights, yeah. for, uh, and I think that you you have to be careful when you've created. I think we need to to distinguish between consciousness and sentience as well. But I think if you've created a conscious entity, then well, first first of all, to get back to the evolutionary point, mm. if it hasn't been subject to the same evolutionary pressures as we have, it could just want to shut itself off. I mean, it, it's not predictive at that point. Mm. Um, John Verbeke has some 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 interesting stuff. Um, he was just asked in a in a chat that was fantastic by uh, Unheard. Oh, I was there. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you were there. Yeah, that. I was at the Unheard one, not the one he did in Oxford, but yeah. Was, no, no, yeah. the Unheard one. Yeah, when, great. when uh, Florence Reed asked him so, something like, "If you are born into an age that's particularly insane," mm. and I think that she said this this age is a, was it uniquely stupid or. Mm. uniquely idiotic or something which is absolutely correct i'm i i'd be concerned about an art of birthing an agi into this current world no, yeah go ahead, go ahead. no well, i'm just remembering what he said which i thought was really amazing was that the bigger risk uh you know the the, the pop culture risk is like terminator 2 it's like yeah. some kind of massive apocalypse yeah, it's yeah, like yeah, the bigger yeah. risk is just an, a complete explosion of total bullshit yeah just nonsense right just yeah, kind of yeah, like yeah, yeah, yeah. this because it because of the nature of its rationality which um yeah what he was making that argument and i thought yeah that that's a really interesting take on on ai right and i, I think what john points to and i and, and others do is about the, the, there's a lot we assume about the nature of consciousness, which which I think is really based on enlightenment thinking, and and I think maybe uh -huh. John would say old cognitive science about the brain, rather than that cognition is actually the body embeddedness. Um, it's a, it's inactive, so you can't really have a cognition without connecting with things and people and getting feedback from the environment. So that's why I'm so stuck on the body idea with this about like if the AI is just language. If it's just language prediction, okay, I'm like it could look incredibly sophisticated, but, but then it wouldn't. Then it wouldn't be. Dan Dennett has something about this in his penultimate book, but it wouldn't be. Um, okay, so I, I got so much stuff going on in my head right now. Mm -hmm. So. We're talking about agency. We're talking about bodies. I want to go back to the Vakey thing because one of the reasons you asked me why I'm standing on this yeah. is I did have a presupposition here, and that's the that the, 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 the AGI would not be mad. It wouldn't be subject to madness. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, interesting. So, so okay. So, if I may yeah. revise my own claim, yes, an AGI, um, if we. I don't want to say birth. If we create an AGI mm. and it turns out to be mad but conscious, it should be entitled to rights. I go here. You're yeah. neutral and I'm disagree. Yeah. Why? Go ahead. Yeah, neutral because um, it depends what we mean by rights, right? The right to do what? Some rights might be ethically applicable right like when someone goes mad in in you know the human world they don't lose they lose some of their rights often yeah. but they don't lose other rights by by virtue of them being mentally unwell or mad right now that's partly i mean it's oh, it's really tricky because that's partly because their mental illness is at least in part an aspect of their <clears throat> world that they're in their upbringing etc the AGI is just bonkers and potentially dangerous, right? Yeah. But at the same time, there's a lot of scope. I mean, there's a lot of sway and madness. Like yeah, maybe yeah, it has yeah, other yeah, aspects yeah, to yeah. it where you're like, oh, it's, we don't want to trap it in a box. But yeah, so why, why, why are you on the disagree? Here's, here, I'll answer your question. But I, when you were speaking, I just had this concern 
let's say it truly is an AGI and it's capable of increasing its own intelligence, mm. maybe even exponentially in short periods of time and all that's entailed by that. I would be deeply concerned. Again, I'm, I'm going into this with the presupposition that it wants to stay conscious. Uh -huh. I would be deeply concerned if we attempted to shut it off or what have you, and it's growing faster than we can understand how mm. it's growing. It would seek vengeance. Yeah. So that would be a reason for me to move to slightly de uh, uh, disagree, maybe even neutral. Although I don't know if, if that risk would be worth having a mad artificial <laughs> intelligence <laughs> entity. Yeah. I, but, but I'm here because it, it, it still, I, I'm here because I'm concerned about what it could do, but I yes. do think that limit that, you know, snails, mollusks and such, we, you know, nobody has virtually nobody, even vegans, most vegans don't have problems with eating them, mm -hmm. no central nervous system, et cetera. As we go up in the consciousness hierarchy, you know, bonobos, mm, yeah, chins, yeah. simians, like I'm, I, we don't eat them. We assign them. Well, you know, um, Peter Singer, the ethicist from Australia, other people assign them a certain kind of right. There's a kind of right hierarchy based mm -hmm. upon consciousness. And yeah. I'd be concerned that, I don't know. I think I think you get you get something like, but see, it's it's different because it wouldn't be low IQ, right? It would be madness. Yeah. So we'd have to take we'd have to look at what we do with people who are clinically insane. I mean, we still give them rights and dignity, etc. Yes. Yeah. But but uh, in a way, like you can have rights, but not really the capacity to exercise those rights. Like if you're criminally insane, you're yeah, locked yeah, up yeah, in an yeah, asylum. Yeah. Sure. You are you allowed to vote? I don't know. Like you know, it depends if you've done something, right? But Let's say you were just very mentally ill. Yeah. Um, I actually, that's really interesting. I don't actually know what the law is around that, but I would imagine that people would be upset about, hey, you know, if you're if you're deemed by the state to be certainly a certain level of mentally ill, you're not allowed to vote. I think that people would rankle at that. So I don't know. I don't know. Yeah. Um, I've been firing questions at you. Do you have any for me? Um, Reed can give us some. Yeah, let's see what's on there. Let's see what's on on here. People have some. We can questions. we can keep doing the technology questions. Let's we, let's go further down into um, ethics, intellectual dark web, uh, big questions, sense making. Sense, why don't we go um, intellectual dark web just because it's a okay. little bit different and it's um, all right. It's on there. Um, yeah. um, what do you think the main goal of the? Let's see. Ah. Um, oh, the IDW is dead. You're on. I'm almost at strongly agree. Yeah, almost. Yeah. If, if I if I were cheating, I'd do that. Yeah. But yeah. I'm basically to agree. Why do you strongly agree? Um, I strongly agree because mm -hmm. I think what the you know I think what uh, what drew people to it and the original. Um, position it was holding and its founding like I said principles were um a movement through the polarization and stuckness of the cultural conversation and to be able to think out loud now i think the idw insofar as it's made up of particular thinkers and particular uh let's say content creators um in that sense i think it is now at this point i think long ago or quite quickly it, it failed in that mission because the pol polarization right, became right, right just as extreme there as is in any other group, even if the conversations were very interesting for a while. Yeah, I'm gonna to add to that if I may. Mm -hmm. It's not only the polarization, but the creation of echo chambers, yeah. but the very things that they were fighting against from the woke derangement syndrome, they started copying yeah. in their own. So, um, but is it, yeah, I, I do think it's dead. I think all the main figures have abandoned it. And mm -hmm. I think that there's, as in every movement, there's fractious infighting. And I, I think that the some of the, the core values that the, I don't even know who, who you want to say were the progenitors or have you, mm. the people who even before Eric Weinstein coined the term, I mean, that, that's, that's been around for a long time. Yeah. Um, yeah. What do you think the main goal? Uh, oh, wait, wait, let's go back. The IDW succeeded. Mm, I'm gonna go here. Be neutral with this. Yeah, I guess succeeded what? But yeah, I, I think it succeeded temporarily in opening the conversation in interesting ways. Um, I think what it also opened the door for was um, 
well, so, something I called quite early the intellectual deep web, which was, okay, the first stage is having the conversation, thinking out loud. Yeah. The next stage is trying to find ways to go beyond our existing frames to some truly new territory. Yeah, yeah. And I think a lot of people felt inspired yeah. by what the intellectual dark web was doing to then, um, including us at, at when we were doing Rebel Wisdom, that was an inspiration. Yeah, yeah. And then we went in different directions. And there are a lot of other groups like Peter Lindbergh at the Stoa. Like yeah. there's a lot he's of great, by the yeah, way. He's fantastic. He's like, fantastic. So that kind of um, opened the doorway for new experimentation. And so in that sense, I think that's a success. Yeah. Um, but then I'm on neutral because I'm like, yeah, but how are we defining success? Because, you know, insofar as they achieve their own goals, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think even before the IDW, it emerged to fight a lot of the madness. Mm. But fundamentally, what we haven't, not we, but what the larger conversation mm. has been about is wonder was already dead. Yeah. yeah Twitter killed good. wonder. You couldn't yeah. wonder aloud. Everyone yeah. would call you. I mean, even today, I'll put out like a thought or something, and I still get like all I just get mobbed. Yeah. <clears throat> and as your, you know, profile increases, the lunatics come out in in force, and it makes wondering. It, wondering comes with a cost. Yes. And so you know, you you can't even wonder. But that gets back to this uh, tribalism. By the way, I read this. Mm -hmm. One of the most disconcerting things I've ever read is a piece <clears throat> in the Epistemology of Democracy by this guy. Um, who writes about my side bias mm. and my side, you know, like my side is right. My, my, my tribe is right, et cetera. And that can't be, you can't educate someone out of that. You can't train someone out of that according to this, this piece. Um, but I, I think that the intellectual dark web was a horse trying to pull a carriage 10 billion times its weight. Like there was yeah. just, there are too many cultural forces, social media. There's just too, institutional capture, ideal <clears throat> excuse me, idea laundering of journals. Yeah. I mean, there was just far too much going on. And if you looked even at the central component, yeah, so I think it's, yeah. I, I, yeah. yeah. Uh, to that point, I think it's very interesting. Um, uh, this, there's this question that, which I think we can riff on, which is, yeah. is it, it is possible to sufficiently mitigate my side bias? Yes. Which I'm going to go, I'm going to go here with. I, I'm, I'm going to say, uh, you're going to go to agree. I'm yeah. going to say strongly agree. Uh, well, yeah. So I'll I'll volunteer my yeah, go, go ahead. Yeah. I think what we're doing right now is the way to do that. Yeah. I think street epistemology, spectrum street epistemology. I think um, the catch though is that you you know I knew from from a, a few questions that you're I don't I God, I'm trying to not use the phrase good faith, but I can't seem to think of another one. Mm. But you're you're a good faith actor. Mm. So, you know, what if you have people who aren't good faith actors or more more precisely, what if you have someone who is absolutely convinced, has kind of moral conviction that changing their mind will make them a bad person? Yeah. And so then they just latch on. But I think if you geared the institution, our academic institutions, to its falsification, falsifiability, street epistemology, toward you know fireside chats or conversations, yeah. if you geared the institutions toward that, I I think you could mitigate my side bias, and that's the word mitigate. Mitigate, yeah, and yeah, that's true. And and I think uh, the only reason I'm not on strongly agree is because I think there will always be people who will never shift. But I think they're in the minority. That's right. There, there's a really small minority. I think, you know, I largely agree with what you said in the sense that it's only for lack of the right practices and frameworks right. and approaches that we have this problem, which is what the whole ethos of rebel wisdom was and, and the work I'm doing now as well, which is, okay, how do you bring in practices that actually work? What John Berbicki would call ecology of practices. Right, right. This is one. Um, you know, other ones I've used are sort of uh, what John would call dialogo, sort of inquiry, yeah, right. right? So you, you kind of... You stay in a space of curiosity and not knowing. Obviously, psychedelics are an incredibly powerful one. They just need to be used in the right framework because they can also go the other direction. And so it's just a question of, um, uh, yeah, what practices are we using and what frameworks are we putting in and what's in the education system? Um, you know, I, I think the way I think, because I went to an international school that, that did the international baccalaureate, which is entirely based on a yes and mixing, multidisciplinary yeah, yeah. What, mixing what things together. Uh, Germany. Germany, oh, okay. yeah. So that, I did take a slight accent. Is that what it I'm is? half Irish, half German. Mm -hmm. but oh, I, this okay. is an international school accent. Oh, that's okay. what I have in my late 30s from, okay. <laughs> from okay. that. But, you know, what's interesting there is that, you know, uh, 
you can train and many people get trained in, in you know professional life at school wherever else to think in, yeah, in a yeah, more yeah. cognitively flexible way it's absolutely possible it's just a question of how you do it god yeah. just think how truly monstrous it is how we've trained a generation of people in our academies to be convinced that dialogue and discourse are bad and we can't platform people we can't even listen to ideas yeah. i mean just think what a true toxin that is yeah i i i also think that as those as that generation who probably were in college in like 2015 16 17 yeah, yeah. i i don't know what this is really very just a kind of intuitive thing i do have a sense that that whole social justice intensity has lessened somewhat right, for sure right and that i think i think i'm sure there's lots of reasons but i have been wondering is part of the reason because a bunch of those who were really just like they, you know, it's 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 really a disgrace that they actually had that kind of poor education and that incredibly ideologically biased education. Yeah. But as they've gone into the working world and the real world, I wonder if it started to mitigate a little bit, where it's like, oh wait a minute, <laughs> it's just nonsense. Like there's a lot more complexity <clears throat> in the world than what my uh, college professor was, was or yeah. or not, or they said, oh my God, look at these racist misogynists, right? Yeah. They just said, uh, every yeah, single yeah, thing yeah, I've or. learned, right? <laughs> every single thing I've learned yeah. is justified. Yeah. Um, all right, uh, Reed, do we have any uh, super chats or anybody want to chat? Um, cool, so uh, do you have any other questions for me? No, I mean, no. I feel good. Like, yeah. I'm gonna go over here and I'll creep yeah. you out. Uh, what, what did you did you get something out of this? I liked it a lot. Yeah, it's fun. You know what? It's it's you know what's a, an aspect of as as well as the actual practice and the I like the impulsive like moving to a spot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, I've done this in um when I've done uh, work with uh, groups around polarizing topics. Like I did at a festival. I did a um, boom festival this summer. I had 200 people and we were doing COVID. And there was oh, wow. a real anti-vax vax split in the group. Oh, wow, wow. But I always would start the um, the process by going, okay, you have to stand on one side of the room, yes, one side of the room, no. You don't overthink it. There's something really key in this, what you're doing, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. You don't overthink it. You can't dilly-dally. Um, I actually did let them have a neutral zone because it was a festival. So I was like, listen, I don't know. It's right, fine, right? right? right, right. But Jenny, I was like, don't go in the neutral zone unless you really feel you have to. Yeah. So I would be like, chocolate ice cream, vanilla ice cream, like chocolate on one side, vanilla yeah, on the other yeah. side. Pineapple's okay and pizza, yes, no, right? And then it's like, then you start throwing questions about COVID lockdowns were justified. Right. Yes, no, right? And then it starts to get a little bit more. But there is something that it just opens the conversation, weirdly, having that. And then also the, um, I mean, I've enjoyed just, you know, chat, getting to know you. And then, mm -hmm. like, I think it's been a really rich conversation. There's also something about physically moving. Yeah, there is something right? about it's that, It's different. Right? Yeah. yeah, it's different. I think it gets, you get to know people better this way and what they think and what would cause them to change their mind, obviously, yeah. than an interview. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I think the interview space is really crowded. And I predict, could be wrong, I predict you're going to see more kinds of things like this emerge. So. You, yeah, absolutely. Are you, uh, you selling the maps? Uh, no, the, the, the maps are reads. Uh, Reed, Reed came yeah. up with the, uh, the, the maps. We did, yeah. yeah, we did this at Eden last night. And uh, boy, those kids were sharp. Yeah, I can imagine. Super sharp. How did you find that generation now? Who, what are they, 16, 17? Yeah, How, so even some younger, 15. I found them to be, uh, some of them in particular, incredibly thoughtful, incredibly smart. Uh, of course, they're self-selected. Right? Sure. So, sure. But um, even some of the, they call them beaks, I'm mm. told, like the teachers, <clears throat> the faculty went, and they were great. And uh, kind of related to that, Reed and I were doing this in the park, and holy shit, like some little kid came up to us to do this, and he was like a super genius. That video will be out pretty soon. I just, he was truly, Reed, was he the smartest person we've ever had on the line? I think he was like the smartest <laughs> awesome. person we've ever had on the line. Um, but it's funny how you run into somebody, you know, like you just run into random people, yeah. and you never really yeah. know who's going to come, what they're going to say. Like, you have no idea. But the Eden group was, um, I just by the questions that they raised, you know, they're mm -hmm. talking. I mean, young kids talking about factors, economics, talking about. I mean, they're really mm -hmm. thoughtful, thoughtful kids. That place just blew my mind. Like we're walking around there, and it's just like as an American in particular, like mm -hmm. that stuff is just. I mean, it's crazy to see these portraits that are hundreds of years old of kids yeah. that have graduated. Um, yeah. yeah, it's pretty crazy. Yeah, nice. That's now that's what that gives. That's hopeful. It's hopeful that they were up for it, and that cool. even that some of them select themselves to do that experience. And yeah, yeah, and then yeah, the, the, cool. the teachers talked about 
doing a training for the teachers. So nice. again, it's free. Anybody yeah. can do this. This Street Epistemology International reads the president of Street Epistemology International. He's working on a great nice. uh, uh, um, course that's coming out. Anyway, thanks awesome. for doing this. Yeah, thank you. It's been an Appreciate absolute pleasure. It. Very man. cool. Yeah. Very cool. Yeah, yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah, I liked it. All right. Thanks, thanks awesome. everybody. Appreciate you tuning in. Thank you for watching. Everything we do is under the umbrella of the National Progress Alliance, nationalprogressalliance.org. It's a nonprofit, independent 501c3. Your generous donations keep us going and keep fueling content like this. So please help us out, make a donation. We very much appreciate it. Thank you.